can we talk about uh, your nickname, Mr. M? Because we see something that you have in front of you there. Yeah, the one of, of the babies here, yeah. And so how did you come to be known as Mr. M? Yeah, of course, it was the camera of my parents. Um, and this was an Aqua Optima uh, with the little orange release button, a big one actually. Um, and I made my first, yeah, first photos with that camera of my parents. Yeah. But my first own camera was a Canon AE-1 uh, program, which I purchased for my own money. Yeah. And do you remember how old you were around at that time? Um, 13? 13? Yeah, 13 or 14. That's actually quite young for someone to buy their own camera. So you were an avid photographer, snap shooter? Yeah, it happened. Uh, uh, yeah, I got the virus, so to say, uh, from my aunt. And um, I touched, um, uh, I think it was a Leica Flex SL, uh, and I got the virus. So I, I, I couldn't afford a Leica. So I. Um, but I, I, I was enthousi enthusiastic about photography right away. Okay. Yeah, and I still have it. Uh, it's an R4S Model 2. Uh, so at that time there was an intensive collaboration between Lights and Minolta. And uh, so lights shared, as you said, the chassis, so the advanced mechanism of the film and so on, but built an own mirror box, uh, own light meter and own design on it. So it's like, a yeah, the base was a Minolta, but uh, over the time and over the models, um, uh, more and more Leica DNA came to these cameras. Until you got to the 8 and 9. Yeah, and the 8 was a complete new development um, uh, in the mid-90s uh, and everything was rebuilt from scratch. That was an M6 which I totally regret that I s I've sold it um, because uh, on top of that later on I discovered it was an O-series camera which was uh, very cheap because it served in the Leica Academy uh, in the Leica school, uh, as it was named these days, and uh, it was later on when it was um, put away from the uh, Leica school, offered to the employees, and I bought it, and I discovered later that this was an O-series, but I sold it, unfortunately. So I'm, I grew up in this area around Wetzlar, and um, so my aunt, as I said, uh, she was uh, an avid uh, photographer, um, having Leicas. And um, so I love photography, I love mechanics, uh, engineering and so on. So it was only very natural to apply for a job or uh, an education uh, at Lights these, these days. And there were uh, like... Uh, a thousand people applying for a job and only 80 were taken. Um, so I was one of the lucky 80s um, and started my career um, as an apprentice in precision mechanics. But at 16 you're still in high school. Um, in Germany it's a bit different. You can choose what kind of school you go. There is like a, a basic uh, education and there's a kind of mid-level mid and then you go high school. And many people in these days didn't do the high school, they did that what we call Realschule. Um, and then uh, doing a, a job in a company, but at the same time you go to school. But it's a school dedicated to the profession you, you're gonna, uh, gonna learn. Yeah, that must have to do with uh, the product manager job I got f back in 1999, I think. So the M6 TTL was ju just launched at Fotokina 98 and I took over in 99 and the M7 
was actually my first project uh, because in these days everybody was yeah, calling for an aperture uh, priority uh, exposure. And so we realized that in the M7. We get you to hold this here. We, haven't, we, we just had the, oh, yeah. um, we just had the M7. Juan and I yeah. both have M7s. Yeah, yeah. It's, so a, it's, a, it's a beautiful camera. Um, and um, yeah, it maybe came a bit late uh, when uh, digital was also uh, already on the horizon. Uh, but it actually was my first uh, worst concept. I remember we presented it at PMA uh, February 24, 2002. Yeah, but at this time, uh, uh, many people said, oh, it's manual uh, exposure only, and uh, I always lose time setting it. Uh, why can't you make an, an auto exposure camera? Uh, so that was the main driver. Um, but the goal uh, these days was already uh, not to break with the general concept of the M, because the M6 had proven that uh, this was really a, uh, a valid concept uh, over decades. And we already had in mind to do another analog version or mechanical version, I have to say, um, which was then the MP, which by the way is now the camera which is uh, the longest time uh, in production uh, of all M's. Yeah, like, like many other companies, as you said, uh, Leica had a hard time to find its place in the digital era. Um, also, the company was financially not in the very best shape because we went to the stock market back in 96. But the money uh, from that didn't go into the company, but to, to the sellers. And so we had to make, yeah, um, to make it with what we had. And on the one hand, we have customers with high expectation about their products, about the image quality. On the, one, on the other hand, the, the possibilities to create a decent cameras these, back in these days was quite a task because all the main components such as sensors or processors uh, were in the hands of big companies. On top of that, to build something new from scratch would also have meant that we need to find new customers. So it was only logical to say, okay, whenever it's possible to build a digital M, we would need to do so because we would cater to all the owners of uh, Leica M lenses. And then luckily Kodak was ready uh, to make a dedicated sensor for the M8, which also, this famous story, I've already told it a hundred times, uh, were able, was able to cope with a very steep incident angle uh, of the M lenses. And by this we could really go the next step and digitalize uh, the M system. That was back in 2006. You all know there were some, uh, which we say in German, Kinderkrankheiten, some child illnesses. Yeah. Um, so the magenta problem is very well known. So this is the, yeah, uh, uh, the experience you make when you do it for the first time. But luckily we have, we had, and we have so loyal customers who even have forgiven, at least partially, this, uh, this shortcomings of the product. And um, yeah, but the M8, uh, in fact, now 15 years ago, was the very first digital M. That was a significant camera for, for Leica because it marks the turnaround also economically for the company. And the building we're sitting in here is partly also thanks to the M9 because uh, what happened is that uh, it was immediately loved by the, the existing M customers, but 
it appealed as well to many DSLR users who had that as a second camera, second system. So we got a lot of new customers who also all needed new lenses because they didn't own uh, these before. So that all went and, and got a dynamic which we didn't expect in the very beginning. So, and by the way, the M9 is the world's first mirrorless full-frame camera. Yeah, and this is something we're not really proud of, uh, that uh, the, 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 the sensor had this, this issue. Um, but a Leica isn't cheap. Um, a Leica stands for a sustainable system uh, for, for long-term compatibility. And uh, this all makes that we, have, we feel a certain uh, responsibility towards the customer. Um, uh, and also, this is something the customers expect from us to say, okay, if we made something wrong, uh, Leica needs to fix it. So we try to keep it up as long as it was possible. Um, and we, we were begging the follow-up company of Kodak um, to make these sensors as long as they could. But there was a moment that they, uh, they shut down uh, this factory and then uh, we had a certain stock but uh, there was a day when the stock was also gone, uh, so we cannot replace M9 sensors right now. Um, but it's, as you said, uh, over a decade back in um, yeah, repair service. Uh, we, but we struggle, like all other camera manufacturers or consumer electronic uh, companies, uh, with the long-term availability of electronic components. Yeah. And uh, you can uh, repair a screwman Leica from the 1930s, but um, if our grandson sits here uh, uh, talking about uh, servicing an M9 in 50 years, it won't be possible. And there is simply great lenses. Um, but it's maybe a bit, bit short answer. Um, you know, this is a 51.4. There is no other 51.4 with another mount which is that compact. I think that is a main driver for many um, because it's a great lens, but the form factor is really small. Uh, and even other uh, full frame mirrorless cameras try and tend to make things smaller. But with all the autofocus mechanics and electronics around the glass, uh, they need to be bigger. Uh, so I would say this is a driving factor, and, uh, but it comes at the price that it is not autofocus. But that makes that there is a reason to be for those lenses, my explanation. And of course, the special rendering our lenses have um, compared to others. Um, uh, because, yeah, you can, with a, a bit trained eye, you can easily detect uh, what sets a Leica lens apart from others. Now, the image circular is uh, exactly the same. Yeah, it's 43 millimeters to cover the 24 by 36. Um, it is, in fact, what you want is a fast and accurate autofocus. What you need to do to get there is you can't move the whole optical system because it's going to be too slow and not accurate enough. Um, so the optical design needs to be completely different from what an M lens can do. Because to make a small autofocus, the focusing lens elements need to be lightweight and need to be small. and uh, you have to, to have a completely different optical design in order to do so. And this makes, unfortunately, the lens bigger. So uh, that is the main difference why there is such a size difference. Actually, it starts even a bit earlier um, because the first camera in this spirit was the Leica Mini Lux back in 95. Um, where we had a high quality lens in a full metal body 
but as a compact camera um, and then with the X1 because the X1 uh, is another milestone in, in our history because it was the first compact camera with a, a big sensor, APS sensor and uh, so you could draw a line from the Minilux to the X1, the X Vario and then over to the, the Q cameras uh, and that's only the yeah, logical approach to have a handy camera, fast, uh, typical Leica design. Um, yeah, and when it became possible to do it with full frame, it wasn't, wasn't even a question that we do it. Were you surprised at the success of the, of the Q2 and, and the Q? It's something you hope for always if you you launch a new camera, but uh, that it it appealed to so many non Leica customers. For many people, the Q and the Q2 are their first Leicas. Uh, fortunately, also not their only then after, because it's kind of a um, yeah a starting point for many uh, to be to become a member of the Leica family. Um, that, that surprised us, uh, but it speaks for the camera itself. Uh, and there is, a, there is a lot of word to mouth, uh, mouth to mouth, um, uh, that people say, I got that and it's great and you must buy one, etc. So that spreads very easily. So even if this is a completely dedicated development, uh, we have to rely on some components which are available or were available uh, at the time when we launched the queue. And one of it is the uh, central uh, leaf shutter. And there you have, there we have looked for the biggest one we could get and the, big, and the diameter determines uh, uh, the f-stop of the lens. And if we would have done a um, 35 or even longer lens, it would only have been an f2 or 2.4 or something. And that wasn't so appealing to us. Um, and we said also with a 28, it's going to be much more versatile than 35 or even longer. So uh, in the end, we said, OK, let's try a 28. Uh, and have a, a nice um, um, uh, aperture, 1.7. Um, so that's the, yeah, that's the reason why it finally was a 28. Um, I think one of the buzzwords now is full frame. Um, and um, I have to say that uh, the, the Q2, um, outperforms sales on the, on the Leica CL by far, which is also a very tiny little system and you can even detach the lens. Yeah, but uh, the Q is far superior. Exactly, that, um, so what we did is we, we, we made up our mind uh, to fill the gap which occurred when we stopped the R system. So we, we, we needed to decide, okay, what, what, what is next? Do we do a new DSLR? Hmm. Uh, it was already on the horizon that mirrorless technology will one day um, exceed or overhaul um, DSLR technology. So then we checked next what mount would be best. Um, and we, we have an intensive research made whether this new full frame mirrorless could be based on an, on an M mount 2.0 or something. But we found out that uh, it's a bit too small to accommodate electrical contacts and also for telephoto. Um, yeah, the diameter is at the limit. And then we said, okay, let's do a new mount. And uh, this became the T mount um, and uh, later on the L mount. Um, but we always had in mind that it would need to accommodate also full frame. So the M uh, is a special kind of animal. Uh, the M is superb for some applications, but not for all. 
um, and the S is also uh, a bit out of the game and we wanted to make a camera which has the most versatile field of application and then you go full frame, you go autofocus and um, in some sort it was a replacement of the R system but uh, yeah things we need to move on and, and, and make a, a new era. Uh, but with M, with S, with Q and SL, we all cover different fields of application and also different target groups. It's, it's a bit like using black and white film. Because uh, if you have a black and white film loaded, uh, at least I, I don't look for colors when I go out and shoot. I look for structures, I look for shadows and lights and uh, all that and um, I, I tend to see black and white. And um, I, I think a thing when I was first using the, f the monochrome, it was, it was really funny because um, I was walking through Paris and there were like umbrellas of a cafe and it looked so nice because they were red and so on. And uh, I said, okay, no. Uh, doesn't make any sense because they, they're going to be gray. So from that perspective, um, it makes you think different. It, ma it makes you focus. Of course, you can say, yeah, I can also do it with um, a color digital camera, but the result is, is different because you tend to create the picture different. On top of that, of course, there is a technical advantage because no buyer pattern, no interpolation uh, increases the, um, uh, the level of detail, the grayscale, and uh, of course the, the resolution and the ISO um, because there is no color filter eating light. It's, uh, as you know, always difficult to talk about uh, specific developments in the future because uh, it would ra maybe raise expectations we cannot fulfill. Um, so we're not aiming of creating an another segment at Leica, uh, not in the core segment. Um, but as you say, um, diversify uh, the product offerings in the, in the, in the different uh, categories. And also, uh, yeah, to keep on innovating uh, because we could not sell an SL2 forever. Uh, so after SL2 is, a, is an SL3 and, and other products to come uh, where we always have to blend the Leica DNA and the specialties which make our brand unique. And also on the other hand, um, market trends because we don't want to fish only in our pond but uh, yeah, try to convince also non-Leica users uh, to become a Leica user and member of uh, this happy and proud family. <laughs>